Uh, I do have some uh, updates on the progress of the sale, and we can talk about them after. I can let you know what, what they are. Nothing that earth-shattering, I guess. Um, that we are looking at closing on the 15th and uh, being, you know, having the rest of the month in the building, the rest of the month of December in the building. Uh, let's see. Today, we look at what it takes to change the world, which is to be a child of God. <laughs> Changing the world is the thing that people want to do when they see what's in the world. The Bible describes it in its wisdom book, Ecclesiastes. In these ways, chapter 1, verse 15, what is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. It's true there are things that are crooked. There are things that are corrupt. Uh, this world has many terrible things, unjust things, and uh, they just cannot be made straight. There's, there are too many of them. They're, they're too large, too complex. Uh, there are lots of reasons why. And what is lacking cannot be counted, meaning the, what we, you know, what is missing from what people need, whether that be, you know, if it's world hunger or whatever else is around. There's so much of it, it cannot be counted how much there is. It's terrible. And it is, it's a terrible thing, which is where it, uh, the 17th and 18th verses come from. He said, I applied my heart to know wisdom and madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a striving after wind. And that seeking to know and understand these things is futile. Because in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Well, far be it from us to say that people should not get knowledge or grow in understanding in the faith. But understand what he's saying is the world is corrupt. The world is crooked and there's so much of it that you can do so little, if you will, about the big picture. Much wisdom brings much vexation. Uh, increase of knowledge is an increase of sorrow. And it's true. The more you know about how the world actually works, um, you know, how powers are, how justice is, um, you know, the, the way that businesses uh, run, the things that happen, in the world. The more you know about it, the, the worse it gets. You realize the place is corrupt, man. Yeah, not everything, but there's so much of it out there that you can't, you can't meet it all. You can't address it all. Um, that's the point that to know these things in some sense is futile because there's nothing, nothing you can do about it. Um, so what can you do? That's why, uh, that's why we said what we did at the outset. You can be a child of God. Uh, will you succeed in changing the system? It's possible, I guess. Systems do change over time. Maybe you will. Um, but, you know, maybe you won't. One thing that you will succeed at is if you want to be a child of God, then you will make the world a better place by being you, by being somebody who is doing what is right. Um, at some, uh, at some level, you know, what, what he's getting at when he says that this is striving after wind. Uh, at some level, you realize that really that's not the answer. The answer is not to understand 
these things and to get others to understand these things, uh, to know what's happening in the inner works of darkness, the mechanisms by which whatever the drug trade perpetuates itself or the slave market, the, um, whatever else, there are many uh, varied and terrible the things that are being done. Um, that's futile. The right thing to do is for you to live right and you to encourage others to do the same. Because in point of fact, that's the only way that these things stop. These things, you know, stop, say, the, the drug trade. And you see the, the slavery that applies as part of the drug trade, the violence, the uh, terrorism, terroristic acts, um, the destruction of addiction uh, to families and finances and, and everything else, all the crimes that are associated with drugs, which is uh, an overwhelming majority of them, actually. You realize that... Uh, you could try to address all of these things one by one, but you're hacking at limbs. If instead we teach what God teaches, that you ought to be in control of yourself, that you are to possess your vessel, that you are to keep yourself clean and pure, uh, sober and abstinent from drugs and alcohol, as the New Testament very plain, makes very plain, and even the Old Testament when it says, do not look on the wine when it swirls about the cup, when it glistens, it, it knows the end of that is a bad thing. If people stop using the drugs, then the drug trade dries up. You don't have to know all the ins and outs of how that works. People just have to stop using it and all of these other things go away. That's what he's getting at. So the way to change the world is for you to be a Christian. Sorry. And so I got to thinking about, well, what does that mean? Uh, it, it can mean a lot of things, but I, I, these are the passages that came to my mind. Um, and maybe some other ones come to your mind and, uh, you know, you can uh, bring those to my attention after the lesson. <laughs> Or bring a lesson yourself, perhaps. But love your enemies is the first thing I thought of in Matthew 5. Um, Jesus is teaching about this. You've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. He makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the nations do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Perfect here means mature, complete. Loving your enemies is not the way of the world, right? The way of the world is your enemies are mistreated, are taken advantage of, um, are downtrodden. You know, when they're, drown when they're down, you step on them. Take advantage of any advantage you have over them. That's how the world is. But when you're a Christian, you don't act that way. You love your enemies. You pray for those who persecute you. So if others are mistreating you, if others... Uh, are being ugly, mean, or, or worse, you understand that it's not personal. You follow what Jesus said. You love them. You pray for them. Because when you do that, you're sons and daughters of the Father who is in heaven. Because our Father in heaven also wants them to do better. That's what he's saying. He makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. It's true. Blessings are available to all of the world. 
Rain falls on the just and the unjust. Everybody gets the blessing of the rain. So we, as children of the Father, should also rain down blessings on everybody, the good and the evil, those that misuse us, those that mistrust us, those that say bad things about us. We still do good to them. We still pray for them that they may repent, that they may come to serve God. As he said, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? It doesn't accomplish anything. If you want to accomplish something in the world, here's the thing you can accomplish. You love everybody, not just those who love you. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? It means it, it's not producing anything. There's not extra there. There's not more. That's just normal, expected behavior. The world acts that way. Tax collectors do this. You know, Gentiles do this. The nations act this way. You go beyond that by showing love to everybody, by showing mercy to everybody. You be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, who sheds his blessings on all. This, is, this doesn't mean that you overlook sin. You go along with error in the churches. We're not talking about any such thing. We're talking about your life as a Christian in the world with those who are about, uh, that are around you day to day. That you show them kindness, that you greet them, that you, you know, when he says, if you greet only your brothers, I mean, it's true. People, you know, kind of stick with their, their own birds of a feather, you know. But as a child of God, you can um, step above that. And uh, you can, you can um, uh, do more by realizing that I don't need to be with people who are just like me. I'll reach out to everybody and uh, show kindness to everybody, especially to the foreigner, to the stranger, to somebody who's new in the situation. And that will change the world because not everybody acts that way. If people acted that way, where would there be where would there be war? Where would there be theft? Where would there be murder? The other thing that I read in Matthew 5 is to be selfless. If you want to change the world, be a Christian, right? Be selfless. Verses 38 down to 42 tell us. Jesus, in his teaching, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, don't resist the one who's evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other as well. If anyone would sue you and take away your tunic, let him have the cloak too. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you. Don't refuse the one who would borrow from you. And under the law, it was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you know, payback, retribution. Um, and this is, you know, in some sense, a protection of the self. You know, I don't want to be defrauded. I don't want to be wronged. And nobody does. But the teaching of the Lord is don't resist the one who's evil. This doesn't mean you don't protect your own life or protect those who are with you. It just means... Look, if somebody's going to mistreat you, you let them. You don't, you don't go out of your way to seek you know, some kind of a revenge, some kind of a payback. Try to stop this. You keep doing what is right. If he slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also, because the cheek doesn't matter to you. That's the idea. You're selfless. It's not personal. They're suing you. They want to take away the tunic or let them have the cloak too. You can have things. We don't care about things. They press you. They force you to go for a mile. Go with them two miles. Why did they need you to go a mile? You know, when he says to go, they force you to go a mile, go with them too. If they needed something, they pressed you into service. Well, choose to serve and keep serving. Give to the one who begs from you. Don't refuse the one who would borrow. Right. I mean, 
It's like everything else here. Do you need them? What do you need them for? Isn't it better to put on some selflessness and take the opportunity, make the opportunity to be about the gospel, to be about the Father's business, to be the influence in the world that changes it for the good. We can do little or nothing about, you know, global issues, national issues, even state or city issues. We can do little about those things, but as Christians, you can do a lot with your, the power of your life and your example among those that you know and those who uh, interact with you daily. The other thing is to make heaven the goal. You know, to make heaven the goal is not uh, is not a marketing slogan. <laughs> Uh, it's not a bumper sticker, right? We're saying your actions are guided and your reactions are guided by an appropriate emphasis, which is that heaven is what I'm working towards. Heaven is the goal. We're thinking about the afterlife. We're thinking about eternity. That's what's behind the Beatitudes when you consider it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, the kingdom of heaven cannot be seen, he would tell us later. <laughs> it does not come with observation. You say, well, then they're still empty-handed. Well, perhaps in the flesh they're still empty-handed. But in the spirit, they have inherited something great, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. And when you realize what has happened, whether that be in your own life and you repent of the past and the mistakes, the things that you did you shouldn't have done and said that you shouldn't have said, where God will comfort you, or whether you realize that this world is broken, there's coming a time you serve God, you live right, there will be justice in the day of judgment. There will be comfort. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. The meek are the self-controlled. Those who are gentle, they're strong to be able to be in control. They inherit the earth, they inherit the land. It belongs to those who are self-possessed, who are strong, who are gentle. Gentleness comes from strength, you know. If you try to... Uh, set something down, you know, something very heavy, and you want to set it down just without a sound, right? <laughs> the heavier it gets, the harder that is, right? <laughs> because strength is what gives gentleness. You need to be strong in the spirit to overcome the problems, the burdens of life and inherit. But again, this is an emphasis on what's coming. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied. The hungry in the world may or may not be. Hopefully, the hungry who come in contact with you are satisfied because you share with them and give to them. But not everybody has access to Christians. Nonetheless, here we speak of the spirit and the desire to be right with God. Blessed are the righteous. Those are rather those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied if you want to be right with God. And this is the other word for righteousness is justice. Justice, which is a word, a term that's being bandied about in our nation. And, you know, most people that use this term don't know what it means. Who will define justice? Who will decide justice? Well, it's going to be God. Do you want to be right with God? Who hunger and thirst for it? Do you hunger and thirst for justice, the real justice of God? These will be satisfied. There's no promise on the others. You keep hearing people talk about uh, you're on the wrong side of history or uh, history 
will will judge you. You know, they talk this way, which is interesting. It's an interesting talking point, but you got to be a lot less concerned about history is going to judge you and a lot more concerned about God is going to judge you. (laughs) We won't be here for history. (laughs) And, you know, I, I sometimes I hardly care what anybody alive thinks, much less people after I'm dead. What do I care? <laughs> but God, yes, it matters what God thinks about everything and everyone. Absolutely, it does. Blessed are the merciful. They'll receive mercy. We're thinking about God. We're thinking about eternity when we show mercy. We read earlier about love your enemies. That's not the way of the world. Drop the tooth for a tooth, eye for an eye. That's not the way of the world. But we are merciful and we will receive mercy from God, at least, if not from others. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. When we purify the heart, that isn't the world. The world doesn't much care about what you think or what's inside What you do that doesn't affect other people, they're not concerned about such matters. But when you are concerned about God, you want to be pure in heart. And that's the blessing. Blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called sons of God. To be a peacemaker is a good thing. Peace with God is where it is. Not peace by compromise. Not peace by, uh, I guess, uh, kind of a false agreement, uh, uh, glossing over differences, that's not peace. Peace with God. Blessed are those who who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, when you are in the kingdom of, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you are in it, and you are persecuted for that sake, you are blessed. This is a very much, that's a very obvious focus on the future rather than the here and now. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And this is true. You see the paintings, you know, the classical paintings, and you hear the words of the Pharisees as recorded in this gospel, how they loved those prophets. And the paintings show them in these beautiful uh, beautiful garb with glory about them. That's not the way it was. They were mistreated. They were hated. Most of them were poor. I understand it's, uh, it's not that picture that people paint. The Pharisees seem to think, you know, they adorn the the tombs of the prophets, but they call themselves the sons of those who killed the prophets. Meaning they're they're adopting a national identity or a physical lineage rather than a focus on the spiritual. This is also a focus on the spiritual, where people mistreat us, and they do. They, They will persecute, they will utter all kinds of evil falsely on account of the Lord. And he said, in this, rejoice and be glad. Not that we're happy about the outcome of being mistreated. He's saying, be glad at the idea that your reward in heaven is great. What's coming will be good for you. And take your place alongside the prophets who were persecuted before you. We also read in the New Testament about overcoming the world. So yes, I think you can be the change in the world as far as being selfless and focusing on eternity, doing the good that your hand finds to do. But we also read briefly. For example, in John 16, I've said these things to you, says Jesus at the end of his Speech in 33, that you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. In Jesus we may have peace. 
There's peace in God, but there may not be peace among men. In fact, if you're at peace with God, some men will make war with you for that reason. Uh, it seems perhaps foreign um, in our country, but that's not really true. A lot of people take issue with the teachings of God, and, and if you're going to espouse them, they'll take issue with you. But you definitely see it in other countries where you know, their regimes, their, their governments have sided with a religion and are putting to death people of other religions, including some of our brethren. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus has overcome because he is resurrected. The worst that the world can offer, death, he has defeated. And we overcome death in him as well. So on the one hand, we say, you be that change that you want to see. And on the other hand, we say, be assured that God has got your back. You're overcoming the world. You are escaping. Your salvation is assured. First John 5, we read, everyone who believes Jesus is the anointed one has been born of God. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born by him or from him. So if you believe Jesus is the Christ, you're born from God. And if you love the Father, you love everybody else who's been born of God, meaning you love your brethren, the Christians. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Well, this is an interesting thing. You've got the, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, and might, uh, or mind, but you have also the, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we think perhaps sometimes that these are at odds or at least complementary, supplementary. <laughs> no, uh, he says, we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. They are hand in hand. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We believe in Jesus. We trust in the Lord who has overcome. And in this, we also overcome. We keep his commandments. They're not burdensome for us because we're born of the world or we're born of God rather. And we overcome the world. You're escaping. You're getting away. And over in 1 John chapter 2, the other thing you can do is to reject what's in the world. The things in the world. Not the people. The things in the world. 1 John 2, 15 down to 17. Don't love the world or the things in it. It doesn't mean don't love people. It means the corruption, the evil, the systems of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. This is what we mean. We're not talking about people. We're talking about the earthly, if you will, the fleshly realm, not the spiritual realm. What is in the world? The world is defined here as the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. These three things, of course, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, the pride of life, correspond to what happened to our mother Eve in the garden. When she looked on the tree and it was desirable for food. Right? Desirable to the eyes. Desirable to make one wise. It looked good. It you know, looked like it would taste good. And it was good for making her wise. Because the devil said that God is holding out on you. You're being duped. She wanted that wisdom. She wanted to know what was behind it. That's pride of life. 
This is the way all sin is. This is not from the Father, it's from the world. It was the serpent who uttered these things, who brought this to bear. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God remains forever. We are to be engaged in the will of God. We are to be engaged in uh, accomplishing his purposes and denying the self, taking up the cross, following him. We are to be the ones who are living for heaven rather than for here. Perhaps one of the reasons that earthly efforts at peace fail is that their definition of peace is wrong. They're looking for everybody to get along and nobody to fight or to use weapons against one another. Which is, of course, a good thing. We don't want people to fight and argue, to go to war, to use weapons. We don't want that. But it stops short of what the real goal is. Those things stop not when you prevent people from having weapons or when you prevent people from having disagreements or you prevent people from having goods rather than sharing them. Those things go away when people obey God and the commandment of God to love your enemy, to share and do good, to give to those who ask of you, to lend from whoever wants to borrow or lend to whoever wants to borrow from you. Right? When people do those things, then the other stuff clears up. The world is passing away with its desires to whoever does the will of God remains forever. It's the will of God that lasts. That's where real lasting justice is. Real lasting peace is. You want to think that where there are Christians, there is not hunger. That Christians will help those who are in need. What we need is more Christians, isn't it? Hmm. Well, let's conclude in that spot there. I had some other things, and I'm not going to do that. They're too. It's too difficult. Uh, I was thinking about the qualities that are espoused for elders and. They are useful. If you think about what your goal in life is in terms of maturity, you can see the kind of life that you want to lead. But uh, it's kind of a strange way of getting there. So that's extra if you want to study. Take a look at 1 Timothy 3 and think about what it says there and think about the opposite of what it says there. <laughs> what would it be to be the opposite of those things? Well, that person would be, you know, a fighter, someone who yells in the streets, right? Somebody who's rude and thoughtless, somebody who's greedy and pushy. You can read it for yourself and, and, and take the lesson from it, but you see that there's a goal, there's a, um, a purpose for the Christian to live. And it applies to everybody, not just to the elders. We're all trying to obtain that kind of maturity. But the end goal is, as we said, to change the world. But you, In some sense, you can't change the world, but you can change you. Uh, you can change the world by changing you, by being a child of God. When you repent of former sins, then you become the force for good, the influence for God's purposes. And you have behind you the scriptures that teach about sharing, about uh, lending, uh, mercy, forgiveness, and you can help others learn what these things are and take them on and do them. This is the idea. And as we said before, it's the root of the problem. It's the root. Uh, I don't mean to discourage you from working in any of these other fields. If you, if you do, those are good things. But understand that in the end, they do boil down to this. 
Living right is the most important thing. Getting others to live right is the best solution to all the world's problems. People living right is the solution to all the world's problems. The problems are all of them traced back to sin. Sin entered the world in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve made the wrong choices. And we've all followed that pattern in time past and have need of repentance. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Repent of the past. You can change. You can be a new person. You can turn over a new leaf. And you can be that influence for what is good. Why not be selfless? These things don't matter. They're not lasting. This world is passing away. And everything that it desires is passing away. Be ready for the next age, for eternity. Well, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. That involves putting Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins and being resurrected from that water, a new creature in Christ Jesus created in him for good works. There's a lot to, there's a lot to do. There's people to be helped. If you need us to help you with that, we have water prepared here. We try to make it easier with a whole bunch of things, uh, additional clothing that we can change into. Um, you know, people stand so that it's easier for you to come out of your seat. But all of these things are aimed at trying to help you to obey the gospel of Jesus before it's too late and be saved from your sins. If today you are a Christian and need our prayers, we will pray, we will pray with you. None of us is above what happens in the world, being overtaken in sin. We need each other. We'll pray for one another, help each other along to heaven, which is the goal. This also is a justice that is not available in the world very often. But we as the children of God understand we, we need forgiveness too. If we forgive one another, we'll build each other up, we'll help each other. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.